<laughs> all right. Well, let's get this webinar started. I'd like to say hello to all of our listeners out there. My name is Abby Bauer, and I am an associate editor for Horde Dairyman Magazine. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Hordes Dairyman and the University of Illinois have been co-hosting these presentations since 2011. We work as a team to coordinate the webinars, and I would like to thank our behind-the-scenes crew of Jim Baltz, who's at the University of Illinois, and Patty Herchin, our online media manager, who do a lot of work before the presentations to make sure that everything goes smoothly every month. I am lucky to have my co-host today, Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois. Together, we have the pleasure of welcoming Carl Berge from the Dairyland Hoof Care Institute, who will be our presenter. Gaining experience as a hoof care provider, a trimming instructor, a hoof health consultant, and an equipment designer, Mr. Berge has become an expert in dairy cattle hoof health. And we're very fortunate to have him with us today to give his presentation, which is titled, Supervise Hoof Health with a No Lameness Tolerance Policy. This month's webinar is sponsored by Zinpro Performance Minerals. We're very pleased to have their support of this program and appreciate it very much. If you're listening to the presentation live, you have access to the handouts um, of the slides that Carl will be presenting from. Those handouts can be found in the GoTo webinar control panel that should be on your screen. If you look down towards the bottom, there is a tab that says handouts. And there you will find two links where you can print out the handouts for today's presentation. Mike, I think um, that's all the announcements I have for now. So if you would please take it from here to further introduce our speaker and begin this month's webinar. Well, thank you very much, Abby. It is uh, my personal and professional honor uh, and good friend to introduce Carl Berge. Uh, Carl was raised on a dairy farm in Switzerland and did his apprentice uh, agricultural training in, in that area. In uh, 1980, he went to a secondary school and then worked as a herd manager on a Wisconsin dairy farm. Uh, he graduated uh, from the hoof care course at IPC Dairy Training Center in Friesland, the Netherlands in 1985. And then in 1989, he launched his full-time hoof trimming business titled a hoof care, uh, Comfort Hoof Care Incorporated and was instrumental in inventing the Acrotrim leg restraint system, which is featured on all uh, comfort uh, shoots at, at this time. Uh, as uh, Abby points out, he's actively involved in training and teaching at this point, and he carries the uh, Professor Emeritus title at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the School of Veterinary Medicine. So, Carl, welcome to our webinar here today, and the program is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you. It, it's, it's my pleasure to have everybody here and, and uh, to discuss uh, supervising hoof health with adapting a no lameness tolerance policy. Uh, the overview I'm going to talk just a little bit about lameness status, lameness cost, trimming mistakes that put cows at risk, the main hoof lesions, and the lesion-orientated approach to combat lameness, so to take care of these lesions. We're going to go into hoof paths and manage of infectious diseases, finish up with trimming schedules, and an action plan for great hoof health. So when we look at lameness around the world, this is quite a, and these are all cited uh, uh, papers in the last uh, 10 years. And we can see it goes anywhere from 8.3% to 54%. And that wasn't that long ago in the Northeastern part of the United States. So uh, as I teach and travel, I've gotten to uh, visit many of these areas. And, and it's always interesting to see what's happening the first time we visit a place. The average lameness uh, with this here is about nearly 25% around the world. And, and we can see here the spread, is, the spread is quite large. Well, why is there such a variation around the world? Uh, one of the things very we have different environments, cow comfort management, the way cows are managed, a preconceived idea about lameness. The lameness losses are not easily visible. So they're not, they don't play as big of a role. They're not so important. We don't see the milk loss that we see when we have to treat a cow for mastitis. And the thing I a lot of times is it's 
and plan, many farms and plan. So we do see the cow becomes ask about what can we do to not have the lameness. <clears throat> There's a lot of incorrect hoof trimming at large. Eh? So as I travel around the world, and, and we'll talk about that. And I think the other thing is the lack of understanding about the lameness causes. So with that, uh, this is a quite interesting slide. It's, it's by days in milk off a dairy comp from about 40,000 cows in the southwestern part of the United States. And what it shows here, uh, we have various lesions. We have digital dermatitis. We have foot rot, none, sole ulcers, toe ulcers, white line lesions. But what it shows here when we look at data as an example, it gives us a, it gives us a story as an example. Foot rot is one of the main lesions of very early lactation. And we're going to talk about that a little later why that is. But the other point I want to make with this is I really don't like to see lameness in the first 60 days of lactation because what, what that generally means is that some of these cows are not going to finish out the lactation for one reason or another because lameness in the early lactation is a much bigger loss than we all think it is. So when we look at the cost of lameness, uh, uh, last year Chuck Gard put these number, uh, Cornell put these number, numbers together, and and they uh, went up a little bit from what where they were before. But we can see here the average cost of lameness is about five hundred and twenty dollars U.S. dollars, and 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 I think it's quite significant on a per case basis when we look at it's the highest of all diseases that are out there. So when we look at the cost of lameness, these are, again, cited studies. Uh, 750 pounds of milk or 340 kilos of lost milk production, and this came from the study of uh, digital dermatitis. So heifers that did not have digital dermatitis in the first lactation produced 340 kilograms more milk in the first lactation. The same, in the same study, they found that 28 extra days, it took the uh, two-year-olds with digital dermatitis to get them pregnant. So that was another good study that was done in 2015. 20% uh, are prematurely called and 2% of the cows die. And these are all studies that were done. So how do we determine lameness status at a dairy? Okay, we can locomotion score, we can hoof lesion recording, we can use the dairy management software and we can do a hoof health analysis. And I'm gonna go to them just briefly a little bit here to look at it. When we look at locomotion scoring, uh, uh, most everybody is familiar with the five point system from, from Simpro. And, and uh, there's the nice posters out there. Uh, in the UK, there is a program, a four point session by, by, by uh, Derek Cole. But today, more and more, as I get to the farms, we're starting to use sometimes for simplicity reason a three-point system, because because uh, <clears throat> it's more simple for the for the workforce, and and it's more clear. We 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 don't have as far of a spread, or we 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 can't decide if she's now a two or a three, or if she a, a four or a five, and and this just makes it a little bit more clear. For me. If we have good foot health, if we got low lameness, we hardly ever use locomotion scoring as a tool. Maybe we use it as a tool to look at a group of cows. You know, we look at as we look at here, we look at, at this video and we watch cows and we see a cow here that's arched. She didn't move, she was very lame. And we can see cows move here in this video. Uh, and what I like to look at is this next cow. She is totally uncomfortable uh, with an arch back. And then we go to the next cow, very content, not in a problem. So the arch uh, of the back, the strides, how they walk. And if we look back now in the video here, just as, as these cows come up for milking here, we've got a cow right here. Her head pops up and down. She has an arch back. Those are all things that, that we need to need to see. And it's very important that we watch move cows. But again, locomotion scoring is only as good as our lameness 
prevention and our lameness treatment afterwards. So when we look at uh, records, we, there is a simple system that we can record with, and we're going to talk about the five lesions afterwards. But I think it's vital today on today's farm to have some type of records because it's great when I go on to a farm and I can look at an e-graph and determine, okay, look at here on these uh, six and a half thousand cows, we've had this many soil ulcers at this time of the year and, and, and all those type of things. So we can actually uh, uh, change the trimming schedule or we can look at why, why are the things here. And, and here with the electronic recording system, we can print analysis out that, that show us year, year to year the, the change, the changing lesions. As an example, this is a graph of digital dermatitis stage, stages at one of the farm with the M2 being the acute ones. And you can see here from 2013 to 2017, is, it was the acute ones were reduced from over 300 down to probably less than 20. But with no records, we can't make management decisions today. And on the larger farms, it's a huge, uh, plays a huge role. And, and I spend a lot of time on my training, on my consulting trips, looking at records and, and making decisions, looking where the problems are coming from. As an example here, we've got a chron chronological comparison of the top five lesions by year. We have the soul ulcers, uh, white line is blue, uh, toe ulcers is purple, soul fractures, and foot rot. And you can see here that over this past year that, that there is actually something else happened at this farm, and we didn't put that in there. Digital dermatitis was reduced. When we reduce digital dermatitis, all the other lesions fall down also. So that's, that's good information to have, especially when we can look at it. But we need to look at it from a, from a yearly basis, mainly look out a year and, and look at what's happening at different times of the year, different stages of the lactations and stuff like that. So is hoof trimming the problem? When you guys look at over here, this video, and, and we'll play it again. So cow handling, you know, is the, is the crowd gate running too hard, okay? If your crowd gate is running good, you have great cow comfort, you run an effective hoof bath, your time out of the pen is less, two, less than two and a half hours a day with three times a day milking, and you have good heat, heat abatement, you have secure floor, and you have, you have a lameness issue, we have a hoof trimming problem in channel, because all these factors, in my opinion, point into, into factors that if those things are done right, Lameness is at very low stages because we've proven that over and over now in multiple uh, sessions. So, hoof trimming expectations or results. And this was a, uh, a comment from Nigel Cook at, I think it was at the uh, Western Dairy Conference. If your farm has a lameness problem, you more than likely also have a hoof trimming problem. So, let's, let's look at why hoof trimming can, can become a problem. Uh, in 2006, uh, Nigel Cook and myself, we looked at 2,500 slaughter cow feet and we evaluated them for, for trimmed or untrimmed feet. And, we invalid, uh, and then we looked at imbalance. We looked at the hoof fall too long, too short, were the walls axial wall removed, abaxial wall removed, and sole surface concavity, multiple things. And what you can see here very clearly that in, in, the, in the dorsal hoof fall too short, a lot of cows ended up too short after they were trimmed. And, and that's very common as the farms get larger, there is less to take off. And, and we're going to discuss that a little bit more. But, but out of the study, basically, we had uh, about uh, roughly 10% that were trimmed. And out of those 10%, we what our conclusion was that the trimming increased the number of short claws that a high percentage of the claws were not properly balanced so that has something to do with trimming and taking a look at it and, and removing the horn at the uh, at the right claw 
So the final conclusion was when we looked at all these aspects that 92.5% of the cows were not trimmed according to like the, the standards that the standard guidelines, the Dutch system that we were uh, looking at, which was like a, uh, like a five point system. So, so with that in mind, uh, you know, as things go on, when a producer looks at, at hoof trimming, what is he really paying for? And a good example is anybody can do a bus cut it's it's really easy to do because we don't really have to think about how much to leave on or or how much to leave on that it actually looks good and and a lot of times i think with the producer it comes to the point that we're still paying for the hoof chips on the floor and and so with, with that it's it's a really important thing that the producer asks the questions more than he should there is not enough question to ask why isn't this cow recovering why and many of those things so what are some of the common mistakes and 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 here i've got like five slides here that show that so this one normally a normal claw should be about three inches or seven and a half centimeters plus about five to six millimeters of salt thickness so this claw when it was measured you can see here it was trimmed back to to nearly uh, uh below two inches or down to two inches okay pretty near the two inches now over here we have one that's too long and 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 uh just a, as an example what we're looking for is exactly this this is for our average 700 kilo cow or 1600 pound cow as they get, get larger uh, okay it's important to take that in consideration so and another thing we're going to look at in a little bit here is on one of the next slide what we actually there's other measures that we can take, especially today on the larger farms where we have a lot of wear. The other thing we always look at is excessive trimming of the inside heel of the hind claw. And what's happening is as soon as we remove that inside heel, the claw becomes as a low angle and the whole dynamics of functionality of, of the whole bovine leg is not working anymore. And that results in extra sole ulcers generally sole ulcers and white line lesions when we look at the picture on the right here this is what it should like this this is a left hind foot just like the other one that inside heel needs to be spared and 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 uh, we want both heels when we look down from the top to be uh, balanced so they should both be at the same height and a lot of times if we do a good job of trimming we don't have to take anything off of the outside claw either to keep them balanced. But the other thing is, when, when the claw is like this, it has by far the best function because the weight comes nicely to the center of the bone structure and it's evenly distributed throughout the whole claw. Removal of the actual wall or inside wall at the toe. So jamming the grinder like this in between the toes is a, is a big no-no. And, and when we understand the anatomy, we well, can see the normal claw here has a strong inside wall, okay? It has an inside wall and an outside wall. The wall is actually the weight-bearing structure of the whole claw. As soon as we take the wall away and the wall is taken away because sometimes the toe has a curl in it or, or doesn't look quite uh, exactly like a show car, so it's removed. And when we remove that, we cause irreversible damage. We can see here this one had the wall removed. There is no more bone left anymore. The bone is the bone is gone because it's probably done multiple times. So this is a real important mistake that a lot of trimmers make, and it results in lame cows three to eight days after trimming. Like this one ended up at the slaughterhouse because she was over trimmed. Uh, taking away the outside wall, so it's the same thing. It's 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 trying to make it look pretty. Again, the wall is the weight. It's a supporting edge of the claw. It should never be removed. And it should look like this when we do a cross cut. Of course, we don't do that on a live cow. But when we cut some of these claws apart that had walls removed, we find a totally a remodification of P3s. And, and that's why these claws don't function properly anymore. And actually, lameness increases with these, these type of cows. And the fifth one is trimming the sole to thin. So as an example, here we already have a thin sole. And that's from too much wear. 
And here we can see somebody trended, and, and you can see, again, both heels were trimmed. We actually nicked, nipped the toe here, 210. We know today is, in today's environment, uh, if we don't have a quarter of an inch or six millimeter of sole thickness, inflammation happens, and that results in toe ulcers or future lameness down the road. So the, the, sole, the sole thickness is incredibly important more important than it ever has been because our cows walk further than more on their claws. Years ago in a tie stall barn, this probably would have never affected the cow, but it's the dynamics that have changed. So when we look at the industry measuring stick, industry measuring stick, what I always see is hoof trimming is measured by the number of cows trimmed an hour or per day. We rarely look at is hoof trimming preventing lameness or causing lameness, uh, uh, or is hoof trimming putting cows and cow welfare at risk? Are the lame cows recovering or do they become lame and stay lame? And that's, that's a huge, huge thing to look at for, for any consultant, for any producer. So why do cows get lame? There's two common claw horn lesions, sole ulcers, white lines, and there is one infectious hoof lesion, stitchal dermatitis. Those three lesions amount to for about 90% of the lameness that I see when I travel around the world. Sure, there's other ones, but the other thing is we're going to make decisions about these three main lesions when we make management decisions because we can't make decisions about 1% or 2%. We have to go for the big numbers. When we look at hoof health through science, this is what we've learned in the last few years. The life cycle approach, no matter what's the causation of lameness, once the cow develops a lesion, they are at much greater risk for developing the same lesion again in the next lactation. So this is due to the permanent anatomical changes to the structure and the function of the claws, which we just saw before. We're taking the wall away, we're, we're losing the bone. Also including skin integrity, the fat pad, the suspensory apparatus, so how the whole cow is suspended up in the, in, the, in the claw, in that supporting edge, and in the bone itself. So more and more, we can only succeed if we prevent. Inflammation today is the prelude for lameness. So inflammation risk, we, and this is something that we, we've always known, but there is a lot more data today to, to back that up. Car calving period has a huge inflammation risk. Trauma from abnormal forces to the claw, so lack of hoof trimming, long claws, or over trimming, making the sole too thin, that can, uh, afford, uh, that can cause trauma, which, which makes it, uh, causes inflammation, which causes problems down the road. Prolonged standing, so overcrowding, heat stress, too long a wave. So anytime a cow stands, her circulation is is somewhat restricted she doesn't have the good circulation so a cow either needs to move or lay down to have good circulation to the claws so this this is something we understand much better today incorrect hoof trimming over trimming or poor therapeutic trimming so if we don't do the right thing with the therapeutic trimming so if we don't uh, uh, do things to the finest inflammation never goes away and that's why lesions never uh, recover Delayed treatment, so the longer we wait to treat it, uh, it's with digital dermatitis, claw horn lesions, or foot rot, that the inflammation goes, goes, uh, gets larger. Improper, no blocking of claw horn lesion. And today it's suggested that we use anti-inflammatories for better lameness recoveries. So one of the things we nearly need to think about is when you have these severely lame cows that we help them allowed. Uh, uh, along with the animal, from an animal welfare standpoint. Calving equals the highest risk for inflammation, okay? And, and what we can do is to, for that inflammation prevention is every animal enters the close-up pen, so three weeks before calving with perfect shaped claws, so perfect weight distribution, perfectly balanced. So what we should do is we should hoof trim, functionally hoof trim, eight to three weeks prior to calving. The other thing is no lameness is accepted in close-up during calving and in the fresh pen. And if there is lameness, 
there is a 24 hour or a same day turnaround time to take care of those lane costs because the, the not dealing with it makes a lot more problems down the road. Uh, no overcrowding of close up and fresh cow pens. Best cow comfort, close up and fresh cow pens. Okay. Here's a question I like. I'd like to know your thoughts on the most important factors to print laminitis at, at calving, especially at first calving. Have you had the same experience that is a, a greater problem at first calving, or do we miss some of the problems in older cows? Um, that's actually a very good question, and, and, and I think there is, there's a, my next couple of slides will point some of that out. One of the things we know is that the first cat lactation happens. First calving is the biggest uh, life change of, of any animal uh, in, 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 in nature. And you can see here, actually, when they looked at standing time before calving, first calf heifers stood up to 60, up to almost two hours longer, uh, four to five, six to four days before calving compared to milk cows. So it's probably because of the growing udder, because of all that. So if they're not standing on properly trimmed claws, inflammation sets in. And what we see here is this is this is a minor problem. This is at one of my farms. We don't always get to all the heifers. This was 30, we can see over here, 30 days post calving, I trimmed her. She had redness. Okay. And 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 to the question about laminitis, laminitis is a symptom. Uh, laminitis is the sign of inflammation. And, and and for me, it's really not a good term. It's the lesions that result from the inflammation. Because as an example, the lamin lamina is on the outside of the claw, uh, in the hoof wall, on the sole. We have corium. We have corium up up above. So we really need to almost need to call it choreitis. Uh, what we see here is actually choreitis because it will be inflammation of the corium of the sole. And you can see here because and this inflammation is only seen on the outside hind claws if they're not properly trimmed. So here we did a proper trim. We stood, stood it up on our toes. And then we modeled the outside claw, which is we trim extra horn away from the, from the sole ulcer site. Uh, so the point to make here is if we don't do this in preventative measures, this little damage makes that animal much more susceptible to sole ulcers in the future because it not only makes red horn, it also damages the digital cushion, it damages the pedal bone uh, below it. So for me, the more redness we see at first calving, the higher risk to develop lesions later in life. Uh, we've gotten really good with making sure the transition is right, that heifers are brought from pasture onto concrete about two months before calving, so they adjust to the concrete. And really today, uh, sole ulcers on most farms are, are not, even, not even an issue anymore. So when we look at the next slide, it, it actually shows us pretty good. We have lactation adjusted incidence of lameness. When we look at sole ulcers as an example, okay, this is why we need to prevent hoof lesions. In uh, first lactation, if they didn't have no lesion, 12% at 12% uh, would, uh, of the animals will get lesion in the second lactation, 20% give it, get it in the third lactation. If they had a lesion, 44% of the lesions, 44% uh, of the animals will, will get lesions again. So that's, that's, that's much higher than, than the 12%. So that's a, almost a fourfold increase. Uh, the same thing we can see down here as an example, white line is very similar, but the other thing we can look at is digital termitis, no lesions. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Only 7% got it. When they had a digital termitis lesion, 32% of them reoccurred. And you can see we, we've got a nice p-value on, on all of those all the way down. So prevention is such a crucial, important point for this. And this is why. On this side here, we can see a nice healthy P3, a nice healthy P3. Here, the P3 was modified. We can see a modific extra bone up here, like we see on these, and we can see bone loss down here. 
this was all due either to to disease to something that happened and and once these damage that damage happens it never goes ever goes back to the normal shape so it never goes back to health and that's why it makes these animals more susceptible to lameness again the same thing with this here the early digital dermatitis is not as big of a problem as the chronic one the chronic ones will always reoccur again okay so going on here we're going to cover these five lesions quickly here and and uh, we're starting with digital dermatitis here is the acute lesion here is the chronic lesion so the acute lesion is is what we call in the next stage here is an m2 lesion and what you can see is that this heifer when she stands that is is the typical m2 this is a typical early m2 lesion too many times this gets missed and and the thing is this is a two-year-old but we really need to look at these uh lesions also in the in the breeding age heifers we're learning so so a couple of things about digital dermatitis the primary cause is the breakdown in the immune system so when the heifers first come in heat their immune system is compromised we have compromised skin integrity the dirtier the feet get and what it does is allows the bacteria or gives the bacteria a place to enter the bacteria need a low oxygen environment so the dirtier the feet are the manure build up manure build up the race the more likely the bacteria start and the notice placing bacteria that cause digital dermatitis on healthy skin will not result in digital dermatitis and that was done multiple times so this is this is a question here what digital dermatitis prevention do you promote with your replacement herd okay well we have got uh, five choices here abby we are uh, getting ready uh, to vote here we have two ch uh, choices uh, uh one don't have digital dermatitis two we do not prevent within our replacement uh replacement herd uh weekly pen walks with topical treatment when necessary number three four pen walk from time to time with topical uh, treatment when necessary frequently use of foot baths boy i'm ready to vote <laughs> well what do you do with your heifers mike well, I, I don't, uh, I tell you what, I, I I would probably go with the last one. I'd frequently use foot, foot bath, hoof baths. So, uh, and Jim indicates you can pick more than one if you want. I'm just going to uh, pick, uh, pick one. I'm going to pick just the one. I'm going to bullet vote here. Abby, do you want to vote on this or are you, uh, are you going to abstain? <laughs> I mean, I think I'll abstain. Um, I don't have any heifers of my own, I guess. You know, ideally, you would not have digital dermatitis in the replacement herd, but I think we're learning more and more that um, some of these lameness problems start at a younger age than we maybe originally anticipated. So um, I like your choice of having a hoof bath right in those heifers and um, getting them started early to help prevent that disease that we know is pretty detrimental. Well, we've got a pretty good uh, vote in already. Uh, Carl, what do you uh, what do you, what do you think uh, of the voting here? Are you happy or unhappy? Yeah, well, uh, we're going to talk about that just a little bit more, just as we continue on. It's it's very good to see that that we've got some of a little bit of everything, you know, that we don't have and and we do not prevent. Uh, we do pen walks we from time to time, and and we use a hoof pads, a high percentage use a hoof pads, so which is good to see. So. Going on, uh, we're going to just go through it here quickly. Uh, healthy skin is an M0. Subclinical stage is a, is, a, is a M1. This subclinical stage, if we don't use a hoof bath, it can be prevented with a hoof bath. If we don't use a hoof bath or if we don't have good hygiene in three to five days, it can turn into an acute M2 stage. So what happens is, is if we treat this early acute stage, with a topical antibiotic, and we're gonna, it's gonna come up in the next slide. We get a black scab in five to eight days. That black scab is it called an M3, or it can also go back to an M0. And we're gonna, we saw that in the slide up above. If we miss this treatment at the particular time, we delay the treatment, the treponines will insist deeper into the tissue, we get hyperkeratosis, or it proliferates, and it's permanent these are also the disease spreaders it's not these early ones so the, the point i want to make here is when we go back to this slide here you can see you can see on this one the hair is still in the lesion 
when we go to the next one, the, lead, the hair is out of the leash. And so this might already be a critical stage. Maybe we're already too late for this one. So this can only be a, like a three to five day window. Uh, here in the, in, the, in the US, we can use safely two grams of tetracycline powder. If we rinse the lesion down with some vinegar, it activates, the, it makes the tetracycline powder stick better. We generally use a light wrap for 24 hours. And we have a very, I have a very high success, we have a very high success rate that way. Uh, or in, in other places where we have the tetracycline aerosols, we, we do three applications about 30 to 45 seconds apart, let it dry on and, and without a bandage and gives us almost the same results. So the, the, the other thing to, to look at is, or I should go back to this one is, uh, the importance of using a topical antibiotic the first time, uh, I can't stress that enough because I've tried everything else under the sun and I never get as good a cure or as good a going back to M0 as not using the tetracycline. So, so an Im important thing is, is to look at, at, the, at the growing heifers and that's, what, that's why the question was. Here you can see we had a very high incidence of M2. Okay, we implemented an intensive weekly walkthrough program treating the early lesions. We also start feeding Avila Plus at this particular dairy, which you can see here uh, after on, later on, the M2s went away because, because it went really down. And then we had another incident like almost like a, a year later. So coming out of the winter was a little bit difficult because I think in the winter we don't always go and look for them. But we were much better with acute lesions during that. And then you can see in the 2016 and 17 range, all of a sudden we just had one here, one there. And that's what a, what, what a, a walk through, weekly walk through, a good observation in those heifers does. What's happening now is because we get them treated in time, we don't have spreaders. We have no longer spreaders in the heifers, so the disease is much less likely to get started if we don't have the spreaders. So, so, the M4s are, if we treat the, the chronic ones, we get to an M4s. This is hyperkeratosis. The spirochetes are deep inside. When we don't use an effective hoof bath, what happens is they reinfect and they make the complete circle again. So this can come from too late of a treatment, but a lot of times it happens if the hoof bath is not working, if hygiene isn't good, all those type of things. So we really need to move on. Uh, we can only achieve uh good control with great hygiene and an effective hoof bath the other thing to understand is a type one when it comes to heifers these are heifers that never had dd in the rearing age so never had dd while they were uh, until two year olds only 13 percent uh got dd in the milking herd okay this is a group of type three animals that had dd more than twice in the, in the rearing period you can see here 67% reinfected again. And, and in, in, my, in my work, it shows it's probably even higher than that. This was a study that was done by the University of Wisconsin. So important digital dermatitis control factors. Observe heifers weekly, starting at 10 months of age. So every, every week we should walk to those heifers, make sure there's not somebody holding up that foot like the, like the, the cow did on the video. I think a good thing is if there is a risk uh, hurt, do feed Avela Plus to heifers starting at 10 months of age, but it also, uh, it, Avela Plus had some other benefits. Treat the first lesion with a topic antibiotic as soon as possible. Observe dry cows, milk cows for early lesions and treat promptly and practice excellent hygiene. So we need to get after it uh, with that. Use an effective hoof bath for prevention. So the role of the hoof bath is to improve hygiene condition on hoofs, then if that doesn't take hoofs for prevention and control of, of these diseases, so foot rot, okay, like we saw on the, one of the first slides, and then control early DD lesions and control M4 lesions. So the, the early DD M1s are eliminated with a hoof bath, that's why hoof bath works, okay? So this is the next question. How often do you monitor your hoof bath that's infecting concentration and pH levels? 
Okay, well, we're off and running again. We got only four choices now, so that'll help our Democrats out. We don't want to confuse them. Monthly, uh, do you monitor that weekly? Our sales rep does this, or we do not monitor Hoofbath uh, PH. Wow. Uh, Jim, one only one vote on this one here? Is that multiple? You can do multiple here. Abby, I'm... I'm uh, I, I'm going to say weekly. I, but I'm, I'm a little nervous. I'm. I wish I had looked at the data. I'm say weekly, <laughs> but uh, um, that's where I'm at. Do you want to jump in on this one? Yeah, I, I would agree weekly. It seems like doing it more often would be um, the better option. And I, I'm not sure what we do with the Horde Sermon Farm. That'll be a good question. I should look into that just out of curiosity. But, but yeah, I'd go with weekly as the recommended way. Yeah, I, I thought, that, Carl, you might have, uh, you know, uh, three times a week or something like that or uh, earth yeah, size, uh, but uh, we are uh, aggressively voting here and yeah. I'm looking here. We've got uh, enough votes in. Let's uh, close the close it. And uh, here we go. Wow. Lots of interesting. Uh, Carl, your thoughts on the vote? Yeah. And that's what I'm going to get to right in my next slide. So that's 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 very that's kind of what I expected. We got to see some people that are right on top of it, you know, weekly, monthly. And, and the important thing is that we monitor that because we have uh, people working with, with the, mixing these solutions and, and sometimes if it's not automated, it doesn't always come out right. So we need to continuously monitor because it's really important. Here, the next slide just shows everybody can take a look at that why the hoof baths should have the dimensions and probably here the sites are important uh, the sidewalls and also the in and out step, they're important to keep the solution in the hoof pass. Even though we're only putting 10 centimeters or three and a quarter to four inches, three and a half to four inches of solution in. And what we can see is the effective hoof pass has, has the length, but the other thing is with the sidewalls, we can see cows move through it much more freely. They don't defecate uh, when, when, we're, when the cows walk in, in through a race, through a through a race like that. And that's one of the things we have found to extend the life of the disinfectants. And you can see here, I got a little, clo come a little closer up. All we had a little straw off the feet, but there was no manure in front of the bath or after the bath. The water after 300 cows was still pretty good. And we're getting quite awesome results at this particular dairy. So important thing. So common hoof bath solution for cleaning, Sometimes if the claws are too dirty, we can use disinfectant, but the disinfectant never gets to the source. So we, what we find is we clean and we can have, we can use soap and bleach. Uh, in the wintertime, some people actually add some salt because salt also acts as disinfectant or people that have sodium hypochlorite available can use sodium hypochlorite. It's very, very uh, effective in cleaning the feet up. And what I found is with some of the hurts I'm working, once we clean the feet, the digital dermatitis Incidents were down because we learned earlier that they can't survive on healthy skin, can't uh, get health, in on healthy skin. We use mild detergents like dish or laundry soap. The common hoof pass solutions for disinfectant, the most effective ones out there is two and a, today is 2.5% copper sulfate. We activate that with sodium bisulfate. And the question was is, uh, the sodium bisulfate uh, ionizes the copper, so it gets it in a better solution. Uh, and it's it's one of those uh, one of those things that a lot of people are doing with acidifiers. The most important part we've learned is that the pH needs to be between three and five. Below three, we're causing too much damage to the skin. I'll show that in the next slide. And above five, the the copper is tied to organic matter. We've got some other things here. And the other thing I want to mention is formalin. Very important to use it at one to 2%, uh, two to three quarts or two to three liters per 200 liters of water. Use formalin only with automation. We're away from people where people are working because of the carcinogen. Integrate other commercial products, but only if they're effective. And that brings to the next question. I'd like to know whether there is a, any valid alternatives to formula or copper sulfate hoof bath in the battle against dermati digital dermatitis. Uh, there's a lot of products on the market and, and uh, a, a lot of different ways it's done. Uh, the, the formula or copper sulfate, they're the old reliable and, 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 but, what I'm seeing is we'll we're, we're be able to reduce them by, by a, a great number anymore. And so there is some, uh, 
some of them that are effective but sometimes they're only effective for like 12 to 14 weeks and then we have an outbreak again so i think we need to intro uh, we need to bring in other products but i haven't found one what i can say okay this is the one this is the only one they use because they all do seem to have either they don't control foot rot as well they control very well the digital dermatitis and not as well as the reliable ones and this just shows this slide here shows what's actually happening to the skin when when the ph gets too low and that's why it's so important that's why the question was we don't want to do this damage because this allows the the bacteria to go in afterwards and 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 we've experienced that a lot in the past. Uh, so, so when we're using a, uh, the disinfecting hoof pass frequently, depending on lake hygiene score, my goal would be one time per week or twice per week with a, with a copper sulfate or formalin or an effective de disinfectant. And if we can, can achieve that, we generally have a hygiene issue, then we should clean more often. We have an ineffective hoof pass solution. The solution either too weak or too, too strong has no disinfecting capabilities or too strong causing damage to the epidermis. Hoof pass is too short. We, we want six seconds of contact time, which is about three dips for each hind foot. And early acute lesions are not properly and promptly treated and uh, uh, the digital dermatitis lesions, and that's, that's another results why. So just a couple of uh, 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 handful more slides here. When we look at sole ulcers, the causes, you guys, you can read over on this. The most important things about the, the uh, control factors, functional hoof trimming of spring and heifers, if raised in confinement, functional hoof trimming one to three times per year, generally two to two times per year, but depending on, on the farm and in my environment. Hoof trimming with the larger model, like I showed on the one picture, uh, picture and the heat abatement. And managing overcrowding, especially uh, during the hot time of the year that's happening right now, coming up here in the next uh, couple of months, because we always see soil ulcers go up. Uh, and keeping a cows away from the beds, from laying down. White line lesions, uh, causes are slippery floors, rough cow handling, overuse of crow gate. And we can see here pictures of the, of the flooring types. So to control it, proper stockmanship, concrete flooring with appropriate grooving, manage overcrowding, and again, the hoof trimming from time to time. Sand bedding makes a huge, uh, uh, has a huge benefit to white line lesion. And then thin soles, uh, over trimming, correct, correct over trimming. I find that 85% of the cows generally are over trimmed when we start doing training, and as soon as we start uh, not over trimming, the lameness uh, disappears, and there's no more thin soles. We have a lot of rough floors out there in some dairies, coarse sand, when the cows stand too much, we have too much heat stress, holding pen time, again, all those other things. So control factors, manage recycled sand, proper concrete grooving, smoothen floors with exposed aggregates, because those ex exposed aggregate uh, results in a whole lot of wear. Functional hoof trimming and a couple of the other things that we already, we can utilize rubber and transfer lanes, slopes where we have 90 degree corners, all those type of things. And foot rot is the inflammation of the soft tissue between the claws that can be, that can be, uh, must be treated very early at early stages and, and with an antibiotic, but with a regular hoof pass, generally, it's very well controlled. And, and you, you, we can see those, those in, in your handout. So to conclude here, every dry cow and spring heifer is assessed eight to three weeks prior to calving, lameness treated within 24 hours, perform one or two more lactation assessment and trims depending on cow housing environment and management. First lactation cows, if we trim them in the close-up, a lot of times we're good at 125 days in lactation, second lactation and over, depending on mattress barns, rubber flooring, sometimes 80 days into lactation or 70 days into lactation, and then and then there every 120 days, 100 to 120 days. And with sand farm, sand beds, we can generally go 125 to 140 days. 
and, and every 120 to 150 days for a follow-up trend. We also need to uh, put down an SOP for chronic lame cows. So cows have had lameness before, they can never go on the normal schedule. So we need to flag them in a the management software and trim them an extra two times per year, especially on their hind feet. The action plan, prevent, prevent, prevent. As we learned, we can't have low lameness if we don't take an preventative approach. Uh, regular locomotion scoring, especially in herds with lameness, manage those trimming schedules, and analyze the uh, records to make management decisions. Go in and evaluate the trimming. Those pictures uh, uh, we had earlier, they showed very well what needs to be done, what, what we can't do that causes more lameness. And then we should evaluate the lame cow recoveries. How do, they, how do they recover? So that's a really important part. If the lame cows don't recover, generally hoof trimming is not done well. So that uh, maybe functional trimming is not done as well and also therapeutic trimming isn't done as well. And then the first trim eight to three weeks prior to calving. The take home is, I can't stress enough, the early identification of DD lesions and the first lesion treated, the first time treated with a topic antibiotic. After that, it doesn't matter anymore. And we need to observe those breeding age heifers. We can use a well-managed hoof bath, ensure hoof bath chemicals proof, proof efficacy and they don't promote skin hyperkeratosis or they don't import the skin. It can be done. Uh, this farm in a year we went from 500 lame cows to 200 lame cows by just implementing a better trimming program and 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 the trimming schedule. So so it can be done even at this farm. They they don't tolerate lameness. We expanded uh, by 2,500 cows and lameness stayed at the same or uh, was it the same level as, as it was before? So it was actually down because of better cow comfort, better, better interaction, better prevention programs. So with that, the success is in the details. Animal, animal welfare is everybody's bottom line, and I thank you so much for listening. Well, very good. Abby, do you want to uh, give a, a quick overview before we get into the Q&A section? Yes, I'll sure will do that. Um, thank you, Carl, very much. That was a tremendous amount of information um, in a sharp presentation. And glad that you were able to get through that and share so much good knowledge with the people that are listening today. Um, we also want to thank Zinpro Performance Minerals for sponsoring the session. Again, we appreciate their support of our webinar this month. If you would like to watch this webinar again, or if you want to share it with someone else, you can visit our archives at any time at www.hordes.com slash webinars. Also, all of you out there who are listening will receive a seven question survey in your email later this week. When you fill that out, you're helping us choose topics for the future and make our webinars even better. So we really appreciate that feedback that you can share with us. We hope that you'll make plans to attend our next webinar, which will take place on Monday, July 9th. The title of that presentation is The Lowdown on Reduced Lignin Alfalfa. Our presenter will be Ev Thomas with Oak Point Consulting, and that webinar will be sponsored by Harv Extra. The August webinar, so skipping ahead two months here, is titled What's Different About Jerseys and What's Not? And that will be presented by our very own Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois and sponsored by KTG North America. Um, so please plan to join us in the upcoming months and learn more about alfalfa and the Jersey breed, which is kind of an up and comer in the dairy industry. Um, I know that Carl answered a few questions during the presentation, but Mike, now would be a great time to go through any other questions that came in during the presentation. Yeah, Carl, if you're all set here, get ready for the speed round. Uh, here, here we go. Uh, question that came in about the manure system and, and the hoof disorders. Flushing versus scraping versus slats versus vacuuming. Uh, and, and any thoughts on the manure system, your favorite or, or not? So, so the less manure the cow has to step through it, the cleaner the cloth stay, the healthier the skin are, so the, the, less, the less problems there are. Uh, so the, probably the worst thing is, is 
uh, alley scrapers because they always push manure in front of them. And the only way the cows can get away is to step into the manure over the manure. Slatted floors sometimes have a disadvantage because we think that the cow should work the manure down, but a lot of times behind the free stalls, there's not enough traffic. So every time they step in the stall, they, they step in a windrow of manure, get, get the cloths dirty or the, the skin dirty, dries on, and then and so it's, it's a higher incidence. Slatted floors are great when we can scrape them down at least once or twice a day, so there is no, ex, no extra manure buildup. And when it comes to flushing, um, I've worked with all of those systems. They all work. Uh, uh, most generally, the flushing today is done when the cows are out, uh, out of the milking parlor. And I've seen very, very good results with that. Carl, another question came in about the fat pad. I think we saw it on some of your slides. Uh, what's your philosophy on the fat pad in the hoof of the animal and its relationship to body condition score? Uh, good question. Um, I, th I think that there is not enough information out there, but from a practical end of it, from what I see out there is, and we've learned that like in 2001, once the fat pad disappears, it's replaced by connective tissue, so scar tissue. I'm completely convinced once that hemorrhaging sets in as a two-year-old, we're losing part of the fat pad because we've done some dissections and we could actually see it. and and and. I'm not sure if that uh, gets bigger again afterwards or not, but, but we know that when they do the ultrasounds, it's very difficult to determine if it's actually fat or if it's connective tissue. And, and so I think we need to do more, more work on it. My honest thing is, is do not worry about it, to do everything on the prevention side to preserve the fat pad. And another thing we learned this last year is that animals that are raised on yielding first so on pasture or dry lots it takes them about six to eight weeks to for the fat pad to completely develop so to get to get the fat pad that they will have once they're inside and if we can do that development before they enter calving it's a great benefit to those animals for the, for the rest of the life well, here's another interesting one, and uh, we're getting questions pretty rapidly now, Carl. In an organic herd, how do you recommend treating digital dermatitis since antibiotics are not be allowed to be used? And the same question for foot rot. What, what's, what's your strategy on organic herds and an antibiotic application? Okay, on organic uh, applications, we need to do everything we can to prevent. So, so if they're using uh, uh, an effective foot pass or an early treatment, with a, say, say a, a copper sulfate spray or with an effective disinfectant, we can knock those M1s out. Once they become an M2, what happens is if you use anything but an antibiotic, it seems like sometimes it's too caustic and it forces the bacteria deeper inside, and that's why they reoccur. So in an organic farm, I would do everything I could to try to prevent this we have to even do more on prevention, I think, uh, in that case, to, to make sure that we can take care of those M1s so they never come to the M2 stages. And Another the question rot, is, oh, okay. I'm sorry, are you done? Yeah, for the foot rot, foot rot, again, early identification, uh, treatment of either a, a bandage, we're packing either two tablespoons of honey between the claws or a sugar and iodine mix which, uh, which draws that infection out, but it has to be done in the first 12 to 20 hours. Highly effective, both of them. Wow, that's good stuff. Uh, another quick question, it was, uh, what about the risk of trimming heavy pregnant animals before calving? Does that concern you or is there any potential problems? You know, I think it's more how the cows are handled. You know, I'm not saying that never, uh, it could never anything happen. Uh, over the years, I mean, I trimmed cows, they needed to be trimmed, uh, or if they're lame, we still have to take a look at them. I think we, uh, when I work with higher pregnant dry cows, I'm definitely, you know, pay more attention. I'm more gentle. I've always tried to be gentle, but, but, uh, but, uh, but I, I, I don't think it, it really, it, there is no data out there that shows that it's, that it, it's, uh, that it, it causes any problems. Not to say that from time to time we couldn't have an animal, but who is to say that, that it was, you know, how can we prove that the trimming caused it? Because there's many other things that can, can, 
can alter some of those things. Okay, um, interesting. All. Um, what about wraps? Uh, when should they be removed at 24 or 48 hours? Uh, different kind of wrapping, uh, la layers of wrapping. What's your philosophy on wraps uh, putting on and taking off? So, so uh, for digital dermatitis, research has shown, presented last year, has shown that a wrap for 24 hours significantly improved the uh, effectiveness. But what we learn is if it stays on much longer and the wrap becomes wet, it goes right back to the, to the, infection, uh, to, to the infection stage because it keeps the skin moist, weak, and the bacteria in the environment. Uh, for claw horn lesions today, uh, the work showed, the research work showed that it's actually prohibiting or it's actually hinders healing process if we apply wraps. And, and, and I guess for me, if I apply a wrap, I like, always like to see it off within 24 hours. And, and we should use like a, a, something that's not tight, just something that's loose, that's keeping a dressing or a disinfectant on there. And, and uh, single layers, no double layers, and, and because sometimes we use a whole roll of, of wet wrap or, or Coflex or something like that, it's difficult for people to take off and then they, they're not taken off and then it causes more problems. So light wraps, if they need to be put on, especially for digital dermatitis, but uh, 24 hours, latest the second day, they should be off. I usually give people Sunday off. If I trim on Saturday, they don't have to take them off on Sunday, but Monday morning. Very good. Uh, here we go. Um, what about this blocking? Uh, plastic block versus wooden blocks and your philosophy on blocking uh, using uh, hoof blocks? Uh, blocks are an essential tool to heal lame cows. And, and uh, uh, wood blocks, uh, the, the reason we use various uh, materials and blocks is probably just wear. If the block, if the wood block stays on for five, for five to six weeks, great that's what we should use but we have farms today where a wood block in five to six days it's completely wore down and we have to apply another block to get the cow to, re to recover so so that's when sometimes the plastic blocks come in, come in or in real severe cases where we have like a toe ulcer that we apply a plastic block we because we really don't want to want this block to wear but in general i i prefer to use as many wood blocks as i can because it's 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 just better but but we have the conditions sometimes where we can't just because they don't stay on long enough and and i think from an economy economic standpoint we can't put five blocks on uh in five weeks because it takes labor it takes time it, it's every time there's a cost involved and so so we need to choose the things that that are more cost effective to stay competitive I think this is a fast one. What is the ideal pH of a hoof bath? Uh, between between three three point zero and, and five. And if if I monitor that and that pH goes uh, up uh, or, or up, for example, should I then reacidify or do I have to replace the entire solution? Uh, in some cases, with some with some products, you can reacidify. You know, and 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 in the past, what people have done is. They put all the acidifier in at the beginning, and so the pH would start out at one or 0.5, and that's that caused too many problems. And and we've got good documentation today that showed too many problems. So, so if we can if we can do that, uh, you know, the solution we know that the solution is fairly good until it gets up to about a pH of five because the copper is not tied to the organic matter. Okay, here's one that I will even spell for you. Against digital dermatitis, one person indicates uh, we've had good results with paracetic acid, P-E-R acetate, uh, two times a week for two weeks, and uh, then after uh, glyc gl glyconic acid, G-L-Y-C-O-L, gliconic acid, uh, to uh, reduce lesions. What do you think about that approach? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, hey, if something works, I'm all for it. Uh, you know, the thing, the thing we just have to see is, as an example, it, does it make an M1 into an M4, into a chronic lesion? So does, does, the, does the product cause hyperkeratosis, which makes the digital dermatitis permanent? If we can keep it under control, uh, you know, I, I think, I think uh, you know, the, definitely a rotation of, of, of the products 
is 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 a great thing, and a lot of farms are doing it. You know, so I'm I've heard of the products, and 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 I've heard of some places they work, and some places they haven't. So, but if somebody has good luck with it, by all means, do it. You know, results is the, results is what counts. Here's our last question that came in, Carl, and I'm going to combine them. If you have an open wound or bleeding, is it necessary to wrap that foot after trimming, or do you wrap all feet after trimming? No, I wouldn't wrap it. I would just apply disinfectant. So at that point in time, the most important thing is to apply a block to actually arrest the claw so, so there is not extra trauma to that lesion that we just trimmed out. So resting would be the most. And and and. For me, I, I would only wrap the, uh, uh, like a severe bleeding one, put a pressure bandage on for maybe five, six hours. After that, we know today that air is the best recovery agent that we can provide because in air, no bacteria can grow. All the bacteria grow, you know, and most of these bacteria grow in anaerobic conditions. So uh, use them sparingly you if you have to use them. But again, the most important thing is they have to come off, and and if if they don't come, if we can't guarantee to come off, they come off. We better off leave them open. Much better recoveries. The one more quick question came in here. Have you heard about some of the herbal treatments used in uh, overseas to treat hairy heel warts or DD? Uh, have you heard of it, and what do you think? Uh, I I have heard of it. I haven't seen any good data, controlled data that showed me that 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 uh, that it actually that it actually works. Some people say it works, and then the next guy says he tried it all. He said it didn't work at all. So let's when we do those type of things, so let's 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 uh, uh, do a uh, do a comparison data and see if it actually works. And one more, I promise, Carl, this last one. Abscesses from white line disease reach the highest part of the hoof, are really hard to heal after you open them up, and they seem very painful to the cow. What do you do? Uh, do these cows normally get culled, or do you go after that, or how aggressive are you in trimming? So, so the reason they don't heal is sometimes because we don't have enough rest on the block, so the claw still hits the ground, and, and, and they, it doesn't reduce that inflammation. And the second point is that we don't taper the margins off. So when we trim out that that uh, white line lesion, and if you look at the pictures that I had on the white line lesion, you can see that the margins probably an inch or two and a half centimeters out on both sides were trimmed out, so they they were soft on the on the right next to the lesion. The hoof wall increased uh, after two and a half uh, centimeters or an inch to the full thickness, and that's what it requires. What generally happens is that people in that case don't have sharp enough knives or sharp enough good enough tools to actually do it. But I see it from time to time. And as soon as we improve the therapeutic trimming, so trimming out those margins, they all, they all recover. It's actually when it comes to lame cows, I can tell everybody is more is better. So I, I want to leave everybody when it comes to lame cow, more is better. When we do functional trimming, less is more. And I think that's, that's a good way to close it. Carl Berge, thank you very much for an excellent uh, webinar and all your great questions, and you answered them very briskly. We could have been here probably till the cows came home. Uh, I'll turn the program back to Abby to uh, uh, promote uh, our next ones, and Abby, we'll turn the program for you to wrap it up. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Carl. A lot of great questions from our listeners, and I guess when you're dealing with lameness that costs over $500 per cow or a case, and all the animal welfare impacts that go along with that. There are a lot of questions and it's a very important topic. So thank you for addressing them today. Um, one more time, we'd like to thank Zinpro Performance Minerals for partnering with us and sponsoring the webinar. Um, we really, really appreciate it. If you wanna learn more about them, go ahead and look them up online. Um, our next webinars that are coming up once again, July 9th, we'll be talking about low reduced lignin alfalfa presented by Ev Thomas with Oak Point Consulting. And then in August, we'll be taking a closer look at what's different about jerseys and maybe what's not so different about them and when we compare them to Holsteins and some of the other breeds. Um, and that will be presented by Mike Hutchins. So we hope that you will consider joining us for those future webinars. Um, all, as always, they'll take place on the second Monday of the month at noon central time. So we hope you'll join us for that. Um, until next time, I'd like to say thank you to all of our listeners out there. And Goodbye from all of us here at Horde Steerman and the University of Illinois. We hope to have you join us again someday.